Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Turfgrass Epistemology. It's Thursday night. It is March 28, 2024. Hope everybody's having a good week so far. We're going to have a good show tonight. I, uh, we're going to go over a very easy and quick potassium paper. And then we're going to do some quick comments. I've been backed up on comments, and I need to get some of those out before I lose track of them. If I have some time, I'm going to open up the phone line, maybe, and see if that's working. <laughs> Haven't had too much success with that in the past, but maybe tonight's the night. Um, and my microphone is almost certainly going to go out. <laughs> I don't know what's going on today, but my microphone's acting funny. Um, so yeah, I'm home alone tonight. My wife is in uh, on the east coast of Florida right now, so and I have a, I have a little bit of a sick, sick daughter. We were in the doctor's office tonight. She's okay, but if I hear little pitter-patters of feet coming down the stairs, I'm going to have to take a break and take care of the kids. I hope you all don't mind. Um, good evening. Oh, Valerio Merley. Mer uh, thank you for your membership. The uh, Super TA, good evening. Looney, Gray Fox, Jeremy Bosch, Internet Surfer. I see a lot of familiar names. Andrew Burr says he's missed the last two shows, but he's here tonight. All caught up. Good. Connecticut Cubana can go UConn. I guess UConn's playing. I don't know. Basketball, I'm assuming. <laughs> I'm assuming it's men. Maybe it's women. I don't know. It's strange. My, 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 sport, my taste in sports has changed over the years. I used to bleed orange and blue. I still bleed orange and blue for the Florida Gators, but I don't watch college football too much anymore. Lately, for some reason, I've been watching pro football. I don't know why. And then ladies college basketball. <laughs> Caitlin Clark has turned me into a, a believer in, in women's basketball. So I watched some of her this year. She'll be actually playing pro ball just a little bit away from me. Maybe a, a car ride away. So maybe I'll go see her play pro. Who knows? Brady says he's got some ice cold water ready to learn tonight. Reed Grevin, good evening. Harper Explorers, good evening. That's a new one. Chuck Benzine gifted one Turfgrass Epistemology membership. A nice. I wonder how does that work? That's in. Uh, oh, Six Sigma was gifted a membership by Chuck Benzine. Well, that's nice of you, Chuck. I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> so thank you for showing me something new tonight. That's so nice of you. So uh, Six Sigma has a. He's usually on here. He or she is usually on here. So. That was very nice of you to do that. Uh, we're going to go over some potassium. Today is the last ta uh, last episode for potassium for a while. I, I think I could go over potassium for several years. <laughs> and it's There's that much stuff in the literature and much that much information. And I probably could do that and not even comprehend half of it or half of what, it, what there is to comprehend. So, but we'll, so we'll come back to it. Um, but tonight will be the last night for potassium. I've been I'm asking the members on the members uh, community tab on my channel what they might be interested in looking at next. Seems like it's probably going to be um, biostimulants, which is not my speciality, to be frank. Um, but I do have, I don't know, six or seven papers on biostimulants already in the folder. And um, some of them show some positive results. Some of them show no results. We'll get into that, I guess in April, I, I, I suppose, if that's what you guys want to hear. But you understand it's, it's coming from someone who will be reading the literature and learning because I'm that's not my area. I mean, that's more like a plant physiology uh, product, right? You're dealing with hormones and various amino acids and stuff in the plant. So you very quickly will see my limitation of knowledge. <laughs> but I'll go over the literature, no problem. As long as there's a paper on it, I'm happy to go over the paper. So we may do that in April, and then I'll get into some mental uh, topics in May. Uh, so let's get into the paper. It's super easy. I'll probably end up reading most of it because it's super short. It's very easy. It's, it's a little bit of a unique paper. It's more of an applied paper that doesn't have a lot of science jargon in it and a lot of stats in it and things like that. It's very straightforward. And I want to use that as an example, one, to show some influence that potassium does have beneficially on winter kill, but also to show you all out there 
what can actually be done when you see stuff. I mean, if you're so inclined to write up your observations and enter it into the literature, it is possible for even, you know, just an average Joe um, operating locker company, operating golf courses and turf and sport complexes and stuff to enter in their observations. Uh, medical clinicians do this all the time. They're not going to do a randomized, you know, double blind human trial. It takes a lot of money, a lot of time. But when they observe something in their practice, they have the, they have the ability to actually publish that as an observation. And so do you. It's definitely doable if that's something you want to entertain or something you're interested in. So tonight's paper is exactly that. It was, it was published by scientists, but it was published as an observation. So I just wanted to keep that in mind. Let's pull up the scoreboard. Let's get to it because it might be a little bit of a long show, but we'll see it. Let's pull up the scoreboard. Scoreboard on potassium. We've gone over this month. So I think this is all of the papers I've gone over for this month. There's two or three other potassium papers early on, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, around fifteen papers I've gone over. It adds up quick. I mean, you just do one paper a day, and before you know it, you've read fifteen papers, you know. So, you know, just a little bit, it's it's a, you know, slow, steady pace. I'm, li- I'm like photosynthesis. I'm extremely inefficient, but I don't stop. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that's a good life lesson. If you're efficient or inefficient, okay. But if you just can keep going, keep going a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, just keep building that base of knowledge. Or you know what, you got 15 papers on potassium we read through and uh, you're, you're gaining a lot of valuable information to use in your practices. Um, so of those papers, we've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 papers that are listed in the none column, meaning that, meaning that somewhere in that paper, they concluded that nothing happened when they applied potassium. So out of 15, there was 11. I said none. And there was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that actually concluded that there was a negative response to applying potassium. And then there was seven or so that concluded a positive response. And tonight's paper is going to be a positive response. There'll be a, you'll see a beneficial uh, response from applied potassium on POA when winter kill could occur. So that's the scoreboard. It'll look, it'll look like that. And um, I don't know if you guys like that or not, but. For those who are new, might not have had a chance to watch any of the potassium papers so far, these columns are not equally weighted, meaning like the majority of the responses are in this none column. (laughs) Whenever there's a positive response, it's only a small portion of these papers usually that shows a positive response. And I want to make sure that it's clear within this positive response, it's almost always on low potassium soils. You'll notice 17 parts per million malic one. 28 parts per million malic 3, 10 parts per million malic 1, 18 parts per million malic 3, 10 parts per million malic 1. They're always very low soils, or almost always very low soils, low potassium soils, when we actually see a beneficial response to applying potassium. Okay, so keep that in mind that, oh, my wife's in the chat. <laughs> Hello. I didn't know she'd be joining me. She's in. She's in the... Uh, east coast of Florida. I don't know exactly what town she's in, but somewhere near the Daytona area. I think she's maybe in, I don't know, New Smyrna, somewhere around New Smyrna Beach, maybe. I can't remember. Anywho, uh, so welcome. Um, all good things. <laughs> okay, this will be new. I haven't ever had my wife watch while we're doing what I'm doing the show. But anyway, that's the scoreboard. Okay. So, um, keep that in mind. Just because you see a positive response doesn't mean you're going to see a positive response. The positive response comes on low case soils and it almost always comes from just a little bit of potassium. And there's numerous papers that you can see on this list that, that reinforce that assertion or that claim. There's numerous papers that show nothing's going to happen. And there's numerous papers that show that excessive potassium can actually result in a negative response. So, so, um, <coughs> No, Andrew Burst, my, my wife is not a member. My wife is the owner. <laughs> she owns all this. All everything behind me, my shirt, the, the the microphone, the camera, all these lights. My wife owns it all. <laughs> so um 
So believe me, she's 100% on board when it comes to, um, to the channel. But, but she's not necessarily a member. <laughs> she, she owns it, though. Okay. Um, let's get to the, the article. It's really short. I'm going to get through it pretty quickly. I'm going to say 15 minutes. I'll get through it. And then I want to oh, go to some, to some uh, comments and perhaps open up the, the, the phone line. And um, maybe if I open up the phone line, my wife can call in and, and uh, <laughs> you know, be part of the show. Who knows? Let's do this and that. Okay. So the title of this paper is called uh is is titled observations on the effect of potassium on winter injury on an annual bluegrass in new jersey in 2015. now this is and my wife's in the chat so she can confirm if i'm right or if i'm wrong this is an example of a paper that was published this, in this case it was by scientists but it, it was published as an observation they just noticed this as they were conducting research or as they were out man managing turf grass they saw it they started collecting data and they put it in a journal it's not a full-blown replicated trial. This is very common. Lou, Lou, who's in the chat, I was telling, I don't know if when you came on, Lou, but um, it's very common in the medical community, and at least in the dental community, when a, when a practitioner sees something happen, they're not going to conduct a full-blown trial, but they, if they see an observation, they can actually put it in the literature as an observation of something they noticed, and at least it gets entered as uh, into the literature to discuss. And that's what this paper is in the turf grass world. So... Um, it's extremely short. It's only two or three pages long. The, let me get my pens ready here. Okay. Uh, the winter of 2014 and 15. Okay. Real quick. The observations on the effect of potassium on winter injury on annual bluegrass in New Jersey in 2015. This was published by Chas Smith, Jim Murphy, Bruce Clark, Michelle DeCosta, and um, Scott Ebden. So all of these guys and gals, I mean, talk about a team of really good authors. Holy cow. Good grief. That is, that is a rock star team right there. Um, and they published this in a crop, in a journal called Crop Forage and Turf Grass Management. This is a practitioner's journal. It's not intended to be published in a way that's uh, with SI units and really complicated scientific um, models and things like that. It's intended to be published in a way that's very easily understood by just the average practitioner. Okay, and this would be the type of journal that if you're ever inclined to do something or print out something or publish something that you observe. Um, or that you find interesting, then this would be the journal for this. And the perfect example of this was several years ago, 10, 15 years ago, when there was a chemical came out, a pre-emergent chemical came out in South Florida. They put, started putting it on golf courses and had mass kill everywhere. The pre-emergent was uh, but still on the market today, but they didn't realize there was actually something they needed to be aware of in, before the application. And, um, and that had to do with organic matter and had a large amount of death. Well, none of that was published. That was a perfect example of something that could have been published into the literature as an observation in the turf grass industry that would have been interesting and useful. And so to keep that in mind in your, your own practices, if you see something that you think it might be interesting and useful to, you know, other practitioners, this would be a journal to consider to put it in. Uh, okay. The winter of 2014 and 15 was abnormally harsh for New Jersey and throughout the Northeast, particularly from late January through early March. Although average global temperatures in February were the second highest on record, temperatures in the eastern United States were colder than average for, for the month. And New Jersey experienced the third coldest February on record. A record rainfall on January 19th of 1.8 inches in New Jersey, followed by a rain-snow mixture on, on January 24th of 2015. And they show that the data, the, the meteorological data in this, in this publication, caused precipitation to accumulate at the surface of the frozen soil and form an ice sheet in many locations. Okay, so that he's explaining what happened and what the conditions that um, resulted in this death. Several subsequent snow and rainfall events occurred in February, which caused a mixed snow and ice cover to persist for a period of 47 days in New Brunswick, New Jersey. These atypical environmental conditions caused widespread winter injury on annual bluegrass, the putting green, throughout New Jersey, which is a relatively uncommon occurrence for the state. So I want to make sure that's clear. We're going to show some positive results of, uh, of following the application of potassium on winter kill. But the authors state this was highly unusual. He even says relatively uncommon occurrence for New Jersey. This is not normal. But in this case, it was, it was it, a perfect mixture, a perfect storm, if you will, of water and ice and snow and kept everything frozen for a very long time. And extensive injury occurred. 
Extension of injury from ice cover and or crown hydration on golf courses in New Jersey has not been observed since 2010. And this was published in 2015. So five years, nothing happened. And, two thousand, and five years later, this happens. Uh, when, uh, since 2010, when record snowfalls caused damage throughout the state, however, injury sustained in 2010 was much less severe than observed in 2015. So they, had, they set the stage, the authors set the stage and say, it was an unusual meteorological event that occurred in 2015 and they had mass death of Poa, Poa greens, um, from winter injury. Okay. I got to make sure that I'm staying on track with my wife in the chat. So, oh, she says, yep, case report. So these are called case reports in her world. Oh, there she goes. The first level of edit. See, I'm, see, it's good to have you in the chat, Lou. So that's the, see, I, even though she, sometimes she accuses me of not listening, I, I am listening. <laughs> I hear what you're saying sometimes, Lou. And then this is an example of that. So they call it a case report. And in our world, we could use the same terminology. It's a case report um, of what they observed in that particular location on turf grass. On the March, on March 12, 2015, the snow and ice cover had melted and no symptoms of winter injury were observed on the annual bluegrass putting green turf at the Rutgers Horticultural Farm in New, New Brunswick, New Jersey, that was being used for a potassium nutritional research trial arranged as a randomized, randomized complete block design with four reps. So they were already conducting this research. They were already conducting potassium research when it happened to hit. And I've said this before, we were already conducting research in Florida when a tropical storm hits. Don't stop taking data. Keep taking it. Even if that storm screws up your study, that's what you think screws up your study, you might actually find very interesting results that you could not otherwise have ever measured because of a, you know, a force majeure, if you will. You know, something that's completely out of your control occurs. Keep taking the data. You might find something that no one else will ever be able to measure during, during those events. And that's what they did. They happened to be doing the study. It was a mass winter kill. They probably got depressed a little bit when they saw their hard work looking bad, but they've turned that into this publication. So um, good for them. If so, it was already being used for potassium research. However, a distinct odor reminiscent of silage was noticed. And after two days, symptoms caused by ice cover and or crown hydration injury began to appear on the annual bluegrass. Visual ratings of the ice cover and or crown hydration injury were collected on March 17, 2015, using a line intersect grid method. Don't worry about that. Um, analysis of it. I'm not going to go into that detail. Uh, they did they basically did an analysis determining how much death occurred on March 17th. Plots had that had received no potassium fertilization for the past three years had 58% turf injury. So that the, they were doing this potassium study, and there was a plot on there that had not received any potassium for three years, and it were th it was those plots that on average had 58% death basically. Okay, whereas the plots that received bi-weekly soluble applications of potassium during the growing season had little to no damage, less than 4% injury. As soil temperatures increased, it was apparent that recovery from injury was occurring in all potassium treatments. However, recovery in plots that had received no potassium was delayed and incomplete. Inspection of annual bluegrass plants from damaged areas revealed regrowth from existing crown tissue. An additional rating of winter injury was collected on April, April 10th, 2015, using the method described above. On this date, plots that received no potassium averaged 32% injury. And it's right over here in this table. I'm going to come back to this table in a second. Whereas plots that received some potassium had no damage. No difference in injury was seen between potassium sources or rates above the lowest application of potassium, which was 1.3 pounds of potassium per year. Injury in the non-potassium plots was most likely due to the 47 days of ice cover described above and or crown hydration. So I wanna make sure we're clear here. They had massive death, 60% death in some cases on plots that received no potassium. Then they had this potassium um, a study going on at the same time, and they had varying rates of potassium and different sources of potassium. At the lowest rate of potassium, which was 1.3 pounds of potassium per year, that solved it. They had other rates of potassium in here. I don't remember the highest rate. I think the highest rate might have been, I don't remember the highest rate. We actually went over this paper already, the, a different, the paper that they were conducting when this study occurred or when this damage occurred. I can't remember the, oh, here it is, potassium rates. Five, the highest rate was five point five and a half pounds. 
They went 1.3 pounds, 2.7 pounds, and 5.5 pounds. And the lowest amount of potassium, the 1.3 pounds of potassium, had the same beneficial impact as applying three times more than that, five and a half pounds, or four, whatever, four times more than that. So this is what I'm saying. I've said it I don't know how many times. My opinion on these issues does not come from a single paper. It comes from numerous papers. And when numerous papers say the same thing, my confidence grows. So when I say, if you have a potassium deficiency, the cure for that is usually about a 2 to 1 in decay application of pot potassium down about a 2 to 1 in decay. So it's just a little bit of potassium just with your normal nitrogen application. And if you're going to see a benefit to that potassium, it's going to come from that. It doesn't need to, you don't need to apply a lot more potassium. In this case, it was just one and a third pounds for the entire year. I know people that are putting down one or two pounds of potassium per application, two or three or four times a year on putting greens. So I want to make sure that that's clear. They, this is not the only paper that's, that's made that claim or made that conclusion, I should, I should say. Okay, it's, You don't need a lot. More than likely, you don't need any. But when you do need it, you don't need a lot. Previous research has shown that winter hardiness of annual bluegrass cover under ice cover had, can be lost in as little as 45 days. Winter hardiness increase in perennial ryegrass when moderate to high rates of K with low to moderate rates of nitrogen have also, were also shown to be beneficial in winter kill. Uh, limited information is available about the effect of potassium on winter hardiness of annual bluegrass. Plant tissue potassium and Malik 3 soil test potassium data collected on September 17th of 2014. So this is before the winter kill, basically. Or, well, yeah, just before the winter that killed it from plots that received no potassium was 1.3% in the tissue and about 28 parts per million malic 3 Okay, right here. So, so the, the plots that received no K had 28 parts per million malic 3 and the tissue had about 1.3% K. When they applied the potassium, <coughs> but the tissue ranged from about 2.6 to 3.1% in the tissue, and the soil malic 3 was 140 to 370. Now remember, the lowest rate of K cured everything. So the potassium in the tissue of the lowest potassium was 2.6. So that was more than enough. And the lowest amount in the soil was 140. So that was enough. We don't know exact, or it's 140 pounds per acre. So it would have been 70, 70 parts per million. So 28 parts per million to 70 parts per million. We don't know exactly where in between there is the exact cliff. But somewhere between 28 and 70 parts per million malic 3 potassium, there was enough potassium. So if you're at 70, what this is saying basically is that if you're at 70, you're for sure going to receive all the benefit from, a, from potassium. You don't need to keep applying more and more and more. Okay? Further research is needed to identify the precise critical level, which is what they said. These initial data suggest the critical level for tissue potassium and soil test Potassium may be between 1.3 and 2.6, and well, just like I said, 28 and 70 parts per million, may like three. Moreover, the evidence of potassium effect on coal hardiness of annual bluegrass was observed following cold acclimation and controlled freeze tests in late 2014. Color differences, oh, I'm not going to read through this. They did a freeze test and basically found the somewhat similar res result. The results from the controlled freezing test indicate that plots receiving no potassium, which is this photograph you're seeing here on the screen, Plots receiving no potassium had diminished cold hardiness, and the LT50, the temperature at which 50% of the units died, was 7 degrees Fahrenheit. Compared with plots that received the potassium, the temperature was reduced to 2 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning you needed to get the temperature lower to kill the turf grass that was receiving potassium. Okay? That's what you would expect whenever you see potassium, the plots receiving potassium not dying. And then you go and do a freeze study and you, and you find out, well, then it actually lowered the freeze temperature down by five degrees. That five degree reduction Fahrenheit, five degree Fahrenheit reduction can make a big difference. <laughs> That's is what the study shows. Winter injury is sporadic in the Northeast United States. And unfortunately, only one year of field data could be recorded. In spite of this, our results suggest that potassium nutrition can influence winter hardiness of annual bluegrass turf and deficiencies in potassium. De can decrease the tolerance 
or you could say deficiencies in potassium can increase your risk of winter kill on annual bluegrass. And, um, and that's it. That's the conclusion. It's a very short paper. Let me go back to the table and the photographs, but here's the tables guys. So here's all the potassium sources. They use potassium chloride, potassium sulfate, potassium carbonate, potassium nitrate, and they applied the potassium at various rates from zero all the way up to five and a half pounds of K per thousand square feet per year. One second, hang on. I'm going to have to get a throat lozenge already. My throat's going, starting to go. And you can see the turf cover on March 17th. And you, oh, actually, I'm going to show all these numbers in a graph anyway. Let me, here's the table. I'm going to show all these in a graph. And here's the, the, what the plots look like. This may look familiar if you've seen the, the PowerPoint slide I've done prior. And you can actually see the plots that receive no potassium plain as day. They're just, you know, half dead, basically. You can see all these yellow plots versus all the green plots. So these plots that are, I've put red squares around are all the plots that receive no potassium. And you can see right next to them, the plots that receive potassium look fine. And you can see plain as day, all these plots that are green are receiving different amounts of potassium and you can't tell any difference between them. <laughs> okay. They're all the exact same. Keep in mind, some of these are receiving one and a half, one and a third pounds. Some of these are receiving five and a half pounds of potassium per thousand square feet, per square feet per year. And you can't see any difference between them. And then, then you'll see the photograph of the free study they did where you, you know, no potassium definitely, um, or I'm sorry, adding potassium definitely reduced the temperature at which half the plots died. Okay, let me go to the PowerPoint. I'm going to show the PowerPoint and um, the the graphs on this PowerPoint real quick. Okay, so the PowerPoint, these, this is the data. We've seen this graph before, I think, if you're familiar with the channel. These are the data, and this is winter kill of annual bluegrass influenced by applied K. And in here, you're going to see non-treated turf on the x-axis. You're going to see potassium chloride in the various rates, potassium sulfite, sulfate, and you see the same potassium rates, okay? Now on the y-axis, we have percent of turf injury, and we're going to look what happened in March, what happened in April, and what happened in May of 2015. Mike Corbin, thank you for your membership. And you'll see that on March, with no potassium, about, like they said, 58% death, and it goes down in April to 30% death, and it goes down in May to about 10% death. But look what happens when you just apply a little bit of potassium. It doesn't matter the source. It doesn't matter when it comes to potassium nitrate, potassium carbonate, potassium sulfate, potassium chloride, just a little bit of potassium and it wipes, wipes out any, or basically lowers the risk to such a low level that it's of no, no longer a concern. Okay. So for those people who, um, I don't know, may, may have been under the impression that potassium is of no value because I keep saying it's a very little, you don't really need to apply any. Here's some evidence to indicate that potassium can be of value, but let's keep things in perspective. Even the author said these conditions were very rare in New Jersey. They, they, didn't ha they don't happen that frequently. And this was specifically noted to be on putting greens that had very low potassium. When they applied a little bit of potassium, it went up to about 70 parts per million malic like three and no problems. So if you already have 70 parts per million malic 3 potassium and you're going to say, well, I heard Dr. Shattuck say to apply potassium to reduce my risk of winter kill and I'm in, you know, Nebraska and got bluegrass or whatever, I, I should apply potassium. Well, if you've got 100 parts per million K or 80 parts per million K malic 3, you're probably not going to see any benefit from that at all because you already have enough in the soil. You don't need to apply anymore. Okay. And finally... If you need to apply more, it's not a lot, <laughs> okay? This whole idea of applying one-to-one -one into Ks, you know, I'm, I'm going to apply a 10-10-10 and a, you know, 13-13-13 and all these other things. It's it, Yeah, you'll see a good response to it. I'm not saying you won't. I'm just saying it's a lot of waste. I'm, well, hey, you know, I'm not even saying it's a lot of waste. All the, all the evidence I've been showing, all the papers are indicating it's, a, it's very wasteful. It's a very wasteful approach to turf grass management, okay? And if you're in lawn care or you're in sod production, you have a very intimate connection between products that you're putting out and the profit of the company <laughs> because you're, pro you're probably, if you're listening to this, you're either an applicator or you're an owner or manager. 
And so your, your connection to the finances is much more intimate than it is in, oftentimes in golf in a sports turf where you have a little bit of a separation between yourself and the actual profitability of the, of the, um, of the program. Oh, my wife's saying something. Let me see what she says. Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. So my wife says, so I actually have a question. I'm going to go and do, oh, well, let's, let's hold on to our seats here. Pardon my turf experience. You mentioned a case report observational study. I did see some different plots without K. Was there actually replications? Yeah, I didn't, I skipped over that really quickly. There were four replications in this study. Yeah. In this particular case, they were doing a full-blown potassium study right in the middle of a freeze. You know, of course, you can't control the freeze, right? But they just happened to be doing a study. What I'm trying to communicate, Lou, to the listeners who are practitioners is that if they're practitioners, let's say you're a golf course superintendent, you're a sport turf, and you know, you're you know, engaged in some practice, and you see something completely off or something unusual or curious or very interesting or whatever the case might be, it's good for you to see that. And it's good to figure out how to manage your way through it. But oftentimes we just move on to the next thing and forget about it. When we really, we, we stop and think, well, what's like the turf industry, our brothers and sisters in the turf industry might benefit from documenting this observation. And there are opportunities for that, I guess is my point in, in, in our industry. You know, there's an opportunity to document that and publish that and get it out so that other practitioners can also learn from, from your experience as well. Now, you don't have to apologize, Lou. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> she says, pardon my non-turf experience, yeah. Uh, my wife and I um, have equal interests in science, but they are completely different areas of science. <laughs> we have... Um, we help each other out, but it's completely in another. I mean, you know, she, she, what she does is many levels above, above my, my pay grade. And, um, oftentimes we have conversations. Sometimes I help her and sometimes she helps me. So, but it's probably not the most, um, I don't know. I mean, to me, it's interesting, but it's probably not the most interesting to the average person to listen to she and I talk. <laughs> is that fair to say, Lou? I don't know. Um, okay, now here's what I'm going to try to do, guys and gals. I'm going to try my best to cancel out of all this stuff, and I'm going to burn through a lot of comments, and I'm at the same time going to open up the phone line, if I can remember how to do this, and I'm going to put the phone number on the screen, and if you want to call in, great. If you don't want to call in, great, no problem. Um, but, uh, if you're interested, if I can see if I can turn that on, I cannot, if you're interested let me, I may open this up real quick. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in having a conversation with me, then, uh, now's your time. Now's your chance. See if I can. Yeah. Okay. That's up there. And let me get this up there. Give me one second. You have to pardon my incompetency here. Okay, so that's the phone number. I believe it's on. It's 859-444-4234. If you want to call in, great. If you don't want to call in, just hang out and listen. That's fine, too. I'm going to burn through some comments. If someone comes, calls in, then I'll uh, try to answer the phone if, if I can. If I can. Half the time, I can't ever figure this thing out. But uh, otherwise, I'll just burn through some comments. <clears throat> Oh yeah, Andrew Burst. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get to that in a second. The answer is no. Andrew I said I ever find a picture, but I'm gonna do my best to describe it. Uh, um, so Andrew Burst's question is: Did you ever find the picture of potassium deficiency? I looked through everything. I looked through all. I'll get to it. It's an, it's one of the comments. Okay, so hold 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 tight, Andrew. I'm gonna get to it, and I'll I'll mention it when I get to that topic. But if you feel like calling in, great. If it if it doesn't work, doesn't work. But if it does, I'll I'll answer your phone call. We can have a conversation. You ask a question. Let's go to uh, this. Okay. And let me go back to me real quick and then open that. There we go. Okay, now, 
So the first comment comes, uh, some, of, some, some of these are emails, and I, I, I eliminate the identification on emails just because I don't know if the, you know, you send me an email, that's confidential in my view. You can, you know, I'd, I'd just rather not put your name on YouTube if you send me an email. Um, but if you put it in the comments of my videos, that's all public. And so I include your, your name and your handle on the comments in, in YouTube. Okay. Uh, so it says, hi, Travis. I hope this message finds you well. I wanted to take a moment to express my genuine appreciation for the valuable content you provide through your channel. It's truly remarkable how your insights into lawn care have resonated with so many people, especially considering your initial underestimation of its appeal. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think, <laughs> well, Lou's on the, Lou's on the chat right now. My wife's on the chat right now. I mean, I, I, she'll, she'll vouch for me. I didn't think anybody would watch this thing. And, um, clearly I was wrong. So, I mean, there's, there's, uh, an interest in this, what I have to, to provide. And it, you know, it, it, it's nice to know that there's people out there that, um, value the, you know, m you know, the information I'm presenting. I mean, that's, that's nice to know that. So, you know, I was wrong and I'm, I'm glad I'm happy to be wrong in this case. Back in late January, I initiated a thread on the lawn forum, um, the, the, oh, the lawn forum .com to shine a light on the exceptional content you offer. You have to forgive me. I put these on here a while back and I can't really remember some of what I wrote, what they wrote in the comments. So this is kind of new to me too. I haven't, I don't remember exactly what all the comments were. So I'm remembering this again. Uh, to shine a light on the exceptional content you offer. It was disheartening to see that you had relatively few subscribers at that time, particularly when I knew that many of the forum were eager to help and educate to become better lawn care managers. Over the past five to six years, I've witnessed a significant surge in the DIY lawn care community, or problems, DIY lawn care products, driven by the industry's recognition of the growing market. However, amidst this proliferation, your presence stands out as a much needed disruptor. Okay, that's nice, I guess. <laughs> Your commitment to providing valuable educational content is refreshing in an industry often dominated by marketing tactics. I think that's a nice way of saying marketing BS. Marketing propaganda. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's being too nice. Or maybe I'm being too mean. I want to thank you for the impact you're making in the lawn care community. Your dedication to education and empowering others is truly commendable, and I look forward to seeing how your platform continues to grow and evolve. Would you be willing to offer... Oh, this is why I put this on here. Would you be willing to offer a student discount to your membership program? I don't know how to do that. Okay. I mean, I, I actually called another, um, then there's another comment later if I, if I remember to put it on here and I, and uh, about finding a different way to have a membership or like, I, I, I'll read the comment when I get to it. I can't remember, but I actually got on the phone with YouTube the whoever was over there and I was going back and forth with them trying to figure out like, can I just give someone a membership? Or can I somehow discount it or something? And I don't know how to do that. Uh, apparently, I can't just give someone a membership. And apparently, um, if I was going to do a discount, um, I would have to have it available. To, I'd have to have another level, like say two dollars or something. And it would be available to anybody. I couldn't restrict who who can and can't come on there. As far as I know, I could be completely wrong on all that. As you all know, I don't know what I'm doing on YouTube, but. Um, I will let you know who, who the person who wrote this, me this email. I looked into it, and as far as I can tell, I, I, I'm I'm stuck with the two layers of memberships. I can add or subtract memberships, but everybody has access to that. So, if anybody else has a <laughs> has a input on that, then let me know. I'm open to other suggestions. So, um, back to the back to the. Let me oh, let me see. Let me see what the chat is. Um, question on a celeprint on other turf eating insects. Application timing. Seen some bill bugs in turf grass. Antennas today. I guess that's antennas today. In, in tiny. So I don't know what that is today. Thanks. Internet surfer. Yeah. So um, when it comes to things like a celeprin and insects, I'll eventually go into that. Well, I'll have someone else go into that. I'll go into the literature. Um, there are some really interesting entomologist in turf grass science i don't know what it is about entomologists but they're all fun to listen to <laughs> i don't know why i mean the, the you know the entomologist here at uk jonathan larson's fantastic the entomologists at uf they're all they all sort of have like a peculiar behavior that i just love listening to them the way they speak and they're so fascinated with all these bugs <laughs> it's so um, I'm, I'm more than happy to go into the entomology, but that I have almost no knowledge of entomology and almost no knowledge of pesticides. So I, I know just enough to be extremely dangerous. 
And so unfortunately, Internet Surfer, that's beyond my expertise. I mean, that's moving me into another lane on the internet, uh, on the turf grass highway. And um, I'll just say I'm not an expert in that. And I'm happy, but I'm happy to go over that. I'll go over um, insecticides and um, pest control, but it'll be through the literature and then I'll have guests come on and provide that expertise. So that's sorry. That's the best I can do. Harper Explorer says disruptor equals rogue renegade. Okay. I, okay. Good. And my wife says, I love this. We need more truth evidence based information out there. So AI, just so you know, and I'm sure as soon as I say this, someone can pull up something from the 1960s or seventies and say, Oh, you're wrong, Travis. And okay, fine. I'm wrong. But to the best of my knowledge, you, you, nowadays you'll hear this phrase, evidence based turf grass management. When I was at UF, um, I, I'd never heard that before. I'd never heard of the phrase evidence based turf grass management. And I ran that by a colleague of mine at UF, and he's like, that's brilliant. You need to trademark that. And we, so we got on the, t- on the phone with uh, attorneys at UF, and they're like, yeah, it's probably not something you want to mess with, and it's, you know, whatever. So we didn't do it. But that phrase, I mean, you know, again, maybe someone had it before this, but I never heard it ever. And that phrase came up when my wife and I were having dinner in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, taking care of a three year old or four year old and a one year old. We're having dinner and she goes, oh, I'm, we're required to follow evidence, we, evidence-based dentistry. And I'm like, that's brilliant. Evidence-based, evidence-based turf grass management. We should do that same thing. And so that's where all that came from. All this, I, this con- not the phrase evidence-based, that's been around for ages, but evidence-based turf grass management, as far as I can tell, was coined by my wife, essentially, at a dinner table. So, and she's a dentist. <laughs> she doesn't know, she doesn't know anything about turf. She knows more about pesticides than I do probably. So, and she, and she knows almost nothing about it. So, um, so that came from her as far as I can tell. CVO hobo. It's refreshing hearing someone talk back by evident, talk back by evidence instead of a salesman that may be using the product or not. Okay, good. Etymology. Yeah. Critters love turf too. Eric says Eric Lickness. and Reed Grevin. So what's the cheapest and easiest way to apply a little bit of K for a home lawn? And do I need to even care if I have 140 pounds of K per acre on Malik one? They suggest two pounds a year. That's a good question, Reed. Um, well, I'll say the same. I was on the, I was on, I was on, um, Calendly today, or was it Calendly yesterday? What's today? Thursday. So it was Calendly this morning with, uh, someone and I, told her it's like we're going through soil tests and stuff and i said well what does your turf look like and she goes well 95 percent of my turf looks fine it looks all good i mean it's, you know it looks good 90 percent, 95 percent looks fine and so i told her if your turf looks fine i don't you know the, the the potassium in your soil test and phosphorus in your soil test is irrelevant to me to some degree i mean it, if, if your turf looks fine then then whatever's in the soil is sufficient um, but she has five or 10% of her lawns don't look fine. And in those cases, she had a soil test and she had, um, she, in her case, she was in a different, she was in a unique situation in, in a different state that uses a different extractant. And in her case, they, they inter- interpreted the value to be low in phosphorus and potassium. And so in that case, her turf looked poor and she had a soil test to confirm that indeed her phosphorus and potassium might be low. So in that case, I said, you might want to include those applications on those lawns. And so to answer your question is, answer your question, Reed, I'm not worried about 140 pounds per acre made like one. That would be around, um, around 140 or 50 pounds per uh, acre of made like three, around 70 to 80 parts per million made like three, something like that. I'm not worried about that number, nor am I worried about any other number that you can give me on potassium on any soil test, unless you tell me your turf grass is not acceptable or has historically not been acceptable as a result of low potassium. In those cases where your turf grass is not acceptable, or let's say, let's say it is acceptable now, but last year it wasn't, and it wasn't because it was low K, now, it's okay, now it looks good, and you're keeping track of the potassium because you, want, you don't want to fall off that cliff again. You don't want the potassium to go down and the turf grass quality to go down again. In those cases, I am interested in the soil test value. Okay, so you know it, uh, the, the answer to this question, Reed, is what does your turf grass look like? 
Okay, so if your turf grass looks fine, uh, you know, and the soil test says apply potassium, the soil test is wrong, basically. That's what it comes down to. Now, if you say, hey, the soil, the turf grass has been iffy, it's been spotty over the last couple of years, it doesn't look that great, and, you know, you, you, and we can go, I'm going to show some, um, I'm going to describe some potassium deficiencies here shortly. And that might help you identify the potassium as being deficient. Then we can talk about the least expensive ways to apply potassium. And the least expensive way to apply a little bit of potassium is almost always like a, well, it depends on what you mean by a little bit. If you're going to put down a half a pound of K or one pound of K, then you can do that with just KCL or SOP, whatever. But what I recommend to everybody, and that pretty much goes across the board for warm season or for cool season, pretty much across the board, is what I've mentioned before on the channel, is that if you want to apply just a little bit of K, if you think that that's the problem, just take your normal nitrogen application that you're putting out. Let's say it's a whatever, 2400 or something or whatever, whatever you're doing. And you're putting out a pound of, let's say you're putting out a pound of in. Just have your fertilizer blender or find a bag that includes half that amount of, with potassium. So 24012 or 20010 or 30015 or whatever the case is. And that's what I mean by just a little bit. So what I mean by just a little bit is about half amount, half the nitrogen you're putting out annually. Let's say you're putting out three pounds in annually. Just put out about a pound, pound and a half of K annually and just do that with your normal nitrogen application. Just add it in as a granular. If you're putting it out as a foliar application, then that's a little bit of a different situation. I mean, you know, you can't just add it in necessarily, but I mean, you can if you can find a, you can find a, raw material that has nitrogen, not a raw material, but a product that has nitrogen with a little bit of potassium and you can do that too. Okay. So that'd be a, that's a long winded way of saying, just cut, just put a little bit of potassium in with your nitrogen application and move on. We'll go worry about something else. Go, you know, deal with your customers, uh, you know, some issue with them or your employees or something, because whatever benefit you're going to get is from the potassium is going to most likely come in a, uh, application of nitrogen that you also include about half of that with potassium. Harper Explorers, welcome to the membership. Thank you for your membership. Western Mass Turf says, any papers on elevated levels of potassium leading to brown patch disease and poa pertensis? Mm -hmm, that's a good one. I don't know about that one. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna say I don't know. I, I certainly don't know. I, I, I don't know of any off the top of my head. I, I've. I don't even recall like even, even, hearing anything about that at all. Western Mass Turf. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is I'm. Un, I'm unaware of anything on pyrotensis that the high levels of K, resulting in, brown patch. Yeah, so I would say I don't know. I don't know. You read Greb and says, "Ha, oh, yep, you're you're, ama you're amazing. I've pointed countless folks to your Bermuda Bible. Maybe that, maybe you're referring to somebody else. I'm, I don't know if that's something I've done or somebody else did. Oh, that was Andrew Burr. Okay, well, you're talking to somebody else. Okay, I'm sorry. Um. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the comments. It looks like you guys are chit-chatting with each other. That's just, that's just really cool. Okay, back to the comments. Okay, good afternoon. I was just watching your video about the National Atmospheric Deposition Program, which is super cool. I had no idea the database existed, and you mentioned that turfgrass responds, responds to sulfur more sensitively today than in the past. You have another video going into more depth on how sulfates affect turfgrass. Thank you for the question. I don't have a name on that. I'm not sure why I left it out. Maybe that was on an email. I don't know. The answer is no, I do not have another video on sulfates. But the reason I don't have another video on sulfates is because I'm, I thought by this point I would have a publication out on calibration, correlation and calibration of sulfate in Kentucky bluegrass. So I was waiting to get that published to come out because there, is, there are very, very few publications on sulfates on turf grass. There's not many. And so I do not have another standalone video and I'm hoping to, to get that publication out. And then once it comes out, I'll, 
present it and do a little bit more on sulfates. But the short and skinny of it on sulfates, if you want to know the elevator speech on sulfates, is that sulfate is needed in order to take up nitrogen. In the absence of sulfate, you can put all the nitrogen out there you want, and it's not going to do a lick of good. So it's kind of like, you know, you're in a room full of food and someone's holding their hand over your mouth and you can't eat it because your, your mouth is blocked. That's kind of the same way with sulfate and with nitrogen. You need, and I think, I think the same thing occurs in the human body, if I'm not mistaken, where you need the sulfate in order to metabolize the nitrogen and the proteins and amino acids and so forth all down the road. Um, so the sulfates are needed for that. And in general, the sulfates will come largely from the organic material. So in areas where it's been stripped out, like the old tobacco farms or saw production, where you're stripping out the top part of the soil, coupled with the cleaning of our emissions and our industrial processes, where we're not emitting so much sulfur into the atmosphere, those two things combined, where you have low organic material and you have low deposition of sulfur, can result in sulfate deficiencies. We're seeing that in corn, we're seeing that in turf grass more now than has ever been reported. So that's the short and skinny on sulfur. Is that they and it can in the, the the Malik three? I'll just say right now the Malik three value when we've done the regression on on Kentucky bluegrass is about seven. That's that's the cliff, and in some seasons it's about four or five. So it varies a little bit based on season. So that's the reason I tell people if your if your Malik three sulfate level is in the double digits, you're probably fine. I've I've done some I've attempted to do some correlations on uh, Malik three soils that had like nine eight and nine and it's very difficult for me to get a response when the malic three sulfur is around eight or nine but in but it's when it gets to seven and below it pops up like a neon sign it's just a bright green square out there when you get down to about seven six five something like that so if you're in the if you're in the double digits 10 11 12 you have virtually no chance of seeing a response to sulfate and then if you're much higher than that um well, you're normally not going to get much higher than that because sulfate is very, very movable in the in the system. But um, double digits, you're good. Single digits, um, probably a concern. And if you're in, I, I, we had a soil test at the GCSA meeting this last uh, month or two ago. I had a guy show a soil test. His, his sulfate level was two, and I was like, "Yeah, you will probably see a response to applying any form of sulfate, gypsum, magnesium sulfate." ammonium sulfate, any form of sulfate, you're going to see a response to applying that more than likely on a, on a Malik three of two of sulfate. So um, that's my elevator speech as quick as I can make it on, on sulfate. Let's go to the next, uh, next comment. Half-Life Lawn says, what does a potassium deficiency look like now? That's what, uh, who was it? Uh, somebody in the chat earlier just asked, what does it, what does it look like? What does a potassium deficiency look like? I have a very good photograph that I cannot find. And I've asked, and you know, I've asked my audience if you can help me go in the Wayback Machine. I had it was it was my profile picture on Twitter for like five years. And I can't find the photograph. I changed phones or I changed computers. I can't find the photograph. And I've looked on my old my old Apple. I have my old Mac on the on the kitchen table trying to see if I've somehow downloaded it on my Mac or something. I can't find it. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it. Okay, I'm going to explain this as best I can because I've had this question I don't know how many times. So let me go back to, um, oh, I took it off. Uh, let me go back to PowerPoint real quick and I'm going to draw this out. I'm going to explain this real quickly and I, at least it'll help, I think. Um, although, like I said, I had a, had a photograph that was absolutely perfect, but it's all good. Okay, so let me pull this up and I'm going to describe and draw out exactly what a potassium deficiency looked like. And it's very, very easy to see. It's not complicated. And it's very consistent from one, from this, from one, from the leaf to the next. Now, let me go to PowerPoint. Okay, now, what I'm looking at here is a photograph I put on the, on the members community tab of some Bermuda grass. I was showing the different I was showing the different colors of the stolons. Okay. This stolon was a normal looking stolon, and another stolon was purple. This is where I had it on the community tab. If you're interested in getting more more in details about various things that I do and research and stuff like this, then join the members. 
join the membership and you'll have access to the community tab and you'll see all this stuff. Now on this photograph, I'm looking at, for those listening, I'm, I'm looking at a photograph of some Bermuda grass that I was growing in in South Florida. And you see these long runners of Bermuda grass where you see a long stolen or a long runner and then it has a node here where there's a little root going, actually that might even be the root right there going down. And then you'll see it branch off and another runner go out from there. Okay, this is all very common. You guys have seen this a thousand times. Uh, now, what I want to point out is this leaf, right? this stem basically in the middle that's coming off of this node right here. Let me make this thing a little bit bigger if I can make this. Um, oh, I can't make the, I can't make the pen any wider. So what I'm, what I'm, what I'm wanting to draw people's attention to is this node right here where there's a, there's a stem coming off of it going directly up um, on the north or straight up on the picture. Now this, when, when, the, when that leaf goes out, when that stem goes out, it's going, to put a, it's going to put a runner out and then it's going to put a leaf out, which is this first leaf right here, okay? Then it's going to put another, then that, that shoot is going to go straight out and it's going to put another leaf out right here. This is the second leaf. And then it goes up. This is the third leaf. It goes up. This is the fourth leaf. This is the fifth leaf. This right here is the sixth leaf. And then look right inside here, the, the, inside the sheath, inside the, the, the highest leaf here, there's another tiny little leaf coming out of the point. That's the next leaf in order. Okay. So let me, so that's the way that grasses grow. There's a, there's a shoot that comes out and then a leaf comes off and then another leaf comes up for the, through that leaf and then it goes off to the side and so forth. Okay. I want to make sure that's clear. Here on the, on the left of this, you'll see it even clearer where you see one leaf come off right here, and then there's another leaf comes off right here, and then it goes up a little bit more, and another leaf, and so forth. So I want to make sure everybody understands how the grass grows, because believe it or not, there's, there's some people, and some professionals, really intelligent people, they don't really understand how the grass grows. There's a, there's a root and a, and a stolen in the ground right over here, and then this long runner goes out and then it puts out another root, and then a long runner goes out and it puts out another root. And each one of these is an individual plant. If you cut this off and you cut it off here, the plant in the middle is still going to live, okay? Because there's a root there. And so the reason I'm mentioning all that ex explanation and description is because if you're going to identify potassium deficiency, the easiest way to do it is to look at the oldest leaf first. So on this example, I'm going to use this leaf right here. On this example, this is the oldest leaf on that stem. Okay. I wish I could make the thing bigger. My, I don't know how to make my, my pen any bigger. Oh, well, it just is what it is. Yeah, I don't have any larger pens here. Yeah, oh, well, we'll live with it. So that's the oldest leaf. If on that leaf, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw it on the next slide. If, on, if that leaf, well, let's just do it this way. If that leaf is solid green and the next leaf up here, whoops, the next leaf up here, uh oh, lose my, lose my mind here. The next leaf up here is the same color. It's solid green. The next leaf is solid green. The next leaf is solid green. And so for everything's green, 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 you don't have a potassium deficiency. Look at here. This, this leaf's green, this leaf's green, that leaf's green, that leaf, they all look kind of the same. You probably don't have a potassium deficiency. Okay. Look over here on, look over here on these leaves. This, this leaf here is green. I, you, know, you can't see the next leaf up, but here, oh, here's, here's a leaf that's green. There's no um, discernible pattern in the color of green or yellow or red or purple or anything like that. It's all sort of just green. Okay, but you want to look at the oldest leaf first, which means in a sward of turf, in a lawn of turf, you might have to go in there and pull a runner out. Okay, I'm going to get to tall fescue in a second. Oh, I didn't take that photograph off. Dang it. I didn't, I didn't do that. But the tall fescue is the same. If it's not a runner, it's a bunch of type grass, it's the exact same thing. You just got to, instead of pulling a runner out, you just got to look at the bunch, the, the oldest leaf on the bunch. It's going to grow the same way. You're going to have an old leaf come, you're going to have one leaf come out, and then a new leaf is going to emerge, and then another new leaf is going to emerge, and you want to work your way back to the oldest leaf and look at that oldest leaf and compare it to some of the newer leaves. If they're similar in color, there's almost no chance you have a potassium deficiency. Okay. The reason for that is, is that potassium is mobile in the plant. And when the new leaf comes out, it, de it demands nutrients and it's going to pull nutrients where it can. And it's going to take that from older leaves, translocate that potassium from the older leaves 
and it's going to translate it in that into the newer leaves where the demand is greatest for potassium. Okay, as opposed to something like iron, where iron is not movable in the plant. You're not going to see iron deficient on the older leaves first. You're going to see iron deficient on the newest leaves first because when where there's a great demand for iron, it's trying it would it would prefer to pull it from the older leaves, but it can't. So the newer leaves end up being deficient in iron. But potassium, it can remove it from the older leaves, and so it does, and the, and the, and the deficiency occurs on the oldest leaves first. And when you have a potassium deficiency, you can, you can bet the farm that it's going to be that way on damn near every stem. Every oldest leaf is going to have a deficiency that's clear. And you're going to pull it back and go, oh, well, Travis was right. Oh, let's look at another one. You're going to look at another one. It's going to be the same. You're going to pull, going to, going to go six inches over. You're going to pull. It's going to be the same. The oldest leaf will have the description. It's going to look like what I'm going to draw in just the next slide. It's not going to look the same as the newest leaf. Okay. So that's step one. You have to understand that potassium deficiencies will not occur as obvious on newest leaves. It will occur more obvious on oldest leaves first. Now, what does it look like? Let me draw it out. So I'm going to try my best to draw a leaf. Um, the leaf is going to be chlorotic on the tips and on the margins first. So that's what I'm going to do my best here to draw is the the tip and the the leaf margins are going to be chlorotic where the in their inner part of the leaf is like say the, this is the let's say this is well I should have drawn it just say this is the, the the stem here down here okay whoop oh I'm not on I'm not on the screen hang on PowerPoint sorry no oh, okay sorry <laughs> I wasn't on sorry so this is my this is my crude drawing <laughs> of a leaf so the yellow part um is the outer margin of the leaf and here's the tip up here okay guys and what you'll see is you'll see the oh, good grief okay you'll see the yellow the yellowing be all in these these areas here this will all be a little bit chlorotic along the margins and at the tip okay and it'll fade from the margins inward towards the middle of the leaf it'll fade from yellow to green and the in the middle and under under incipient potassium stress. Okay, the middle part here will all this will all be sort of greenish. This will be the in, inner part of the leaf and this will all be greenish and the and this will be fading in from yellow to green. Uh, in the, in during initial incipient potassium stresses. During it, when when it if it continues and potassium stress continues and continues and the newer leaves continue to emerge, it's going to continue to pull that potassium out, the tips will start to die back. So the, the, it'll be exacerbated. The, the majority of the damage and the, the currents will occur up here at the tip. That's where you'll see this. It'll actually start to turn a different color. It'll actually start to turn like a brownish, golden brownish color. It'll start to fade and, and desiccate, basically what it'll be. So the tip will start to die back and under severe cases. And then eventually it'll die back from the margins inward, essentially. Okay. So that's what to look for. Oldest leaves will look similar to this. And it won't be one oldest leaf. And then maybe you find another oldest leaf. It'll be every oldest leaf. It'll every single, 99% of the leaves, if you have potassium deficiency, the oldest leaves will have chlor chlorosis. I see what I did. I didn't put that on this. It'll have chlorosis towards the, um, what am I doing wrong here? PowerPoint. It'll have chlorosis. Oh, something's not working. Can't get it to work. Um, oh. There we go. Oh. That's got to bear with me here. PowerPoint. There we go. So it'll have chlorosis. From the margins inward and it'll fade into lighter lighter uh greener and then it'll be completely green in the in the middle of the rib of the of the leaf under incipient and then when it gets really really bad it'll just continue to get worse and worse on the oldest leaves so that is what oh did i oh 
Sorry. Yeah. So that's what incipient means. Yeah. So incipient means, yeah, beginning to come into being or to become a parent. Yeah. The, the initial signs of the stress, yeah, that's, that's what you'll see. You'll see a light color on the rib, on the margins of the leaf and on the tip, very light chlorosis on the oldest leaves. And it'll continue to exacerbate, continue to get worse and worse um, as the plant continues to grow. And as the potassium deficiency continues, it'll continue to get more pronounced. Um, but it's very, it's actually very fun to see because, I mean, I mean, not if you're experiencing it. I mean, you're not, I don't, I don't want you to lose customers or anything, but it's fun to see because you're like, oh, I see what he's talking about. And then you start digging down in the leaf and you're like, well, son of a gun, it is on the oldest leaf. And then you're like, and then I'm like, eh, that's probably just coincidental. You go to the next plant. It's on the oldest leaf on that plant too. It's on the oldest leaf on that plant. Now it doesn't always necessarily mean it's potassium because magnesium deficiencies will occur in a very similar way. Okay. Can also be magnesium. It's very similar, but magnesium deficiencies aren't quite as common. Okay. So I'm not going to differentiate between potassium deficiencies and magnesium deficiencies because they're very subtle differences, but they both occur on older leaves first and they both occur in a similar fashion. Um, but the potassium deficiency is a little bit less on a margin. It's a little more of a whole leaf, uh, chlorosis rather than on the margins of the leaf. Okay. I hope that helps. I hope I didn't screw it up <laughs> from somebody that was, uh, hoping to get a clear explanation or a clear photograph and feel free. I mean, if somebody wants to go figure out a way to get my profile picture from t Twitter, three or four years ago it's on there i just i tried it and i couldn't find it now how do i go back to word word there it is word okay guys so back to word now let's get that off there okay back to word so that's what a deficiency looks like but a potassium deficiency looks like oh and the fun thing is i kind of got it I'm, I'm not a plant physiologist as you know but I, I, it is a weakness of mine um, but I, and I try to learn more about it, but the, the, it's difficult on grasses, especially things like ultra dwarf Bermuda grasses or bent grasses where you have tiny leaves. You have a leaf the size of a grain of rice. It's tiny. And the, the stolons and the, the inner nodes are super short. Um, but I used to grow bamboo in Gainesville and bamboo is a grass. It's, it's a different type of grass, but it's a grass and the leaves grow in a similar fashion. And you could see that as plain as day because the leaf is a size, I mean, it's the size of a, of a knife. I mean, it's a real long leaf. And you could see those deficiencies just pop out plain as day. And I took some photographs of that too back years ago. But those are, they're fun to actually see when you can see it so obvious on a large leaf like that. Okay, back to the comments. Kobe Grant, I'm just, I'm just going to get some Stay Green 2500 and call it a day and more importantly, save some money. Thanks for the information. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. I mean, you know, I, would, I would also want to make sure it's clear here. He, he's basically saying, I'm just going to get some nitrogen and put it out and we're good. It's probably, that's probably all you need. Having said that, just so I can cover everything, okay, is that when you're dealing with um, five or 10 lawns, five or 10 customers here or there, you're fine. It's fine. When, when I'm dealing on YouTube and I'm dealing with, you know, five or 10, well, I'd say I'm dealing with two or three clients on Calendly a week. And they're dealing with 300 customers or a thousand customers. You're dealing with, I might be dealing with thousands of lawns that I might be, you know, um, impacting. You're probably going to have 1% or 2% of those lawns that have some sort of abnormality that is not cured by nitrogen. So I just want to make sure it's clear <laughs> that when I say nitrogen only, I'm talking about the majority of cases, but there's clearly cases where you might need a little phosphorus or you might need a little potassium. Okay. I don't want to say, I don't want to have um, this misunderstanding in my audience that I don't, I don't ever recommend potassium or phosphorus. I don't want to have that misunderstanding. Uh, there are cases, in fact, I did today with, with, um, with a lady out in Utah. I said, you know, you have unacceptable turf in some cases and you have a soil test that says you're low in P and K. You probably want to stick with a little P and K on those, on those lawns. So, but I just, I just want to make sure it's clear is that my criteria is to have a good reason to include phosphorus and potassium and good reasons don't include because everybody else is doing it. They don't include because I've always done it myself. They don't include because the, 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 uh, marketing sheet says I need to do it. They also don't include because the soil test recommends applying two pounds a K. None of those are good reasons. Okay. What a good reason is, is because 
The turf grass is unacceptable. I've done a pro I've done my proper diligence. I've checked the water. I've checked the light. I've checked the temperature, making sure that there's no major no major influences from those factors that could be skewing the results or could be altering it. I've checked injury for things like you know fall armyworms or nematodes or whatever the case might be, and I've eliminated those as as possible causes. And then I've gone to the soil. And when I went to the soil, I took a test and I and I found my potassium was ten parts per million, or my phosphorus was five parts per million, or something very low. That's a good reason. Okay. So I'm just saying have a good reason to spend money on something other than just nitrogen because there's ample good reasons to spend money on nitrogen. But there's not a whole lot of good reasons to, to just blindly apply phosphorus and potassium and magnesium and anything else, zinc and boron. There's very few good reasons to include those elements as a blanket application in your program. Back to, the, back to the comments. Eric Lickness says, as a homeowner, I only just got out of big box garden centers and finally found our local Site 1 Lesco storefront. And now I will stay away from their NOS, <laughs> NOS Plus and Opticoda stuff. Just give me some 46.0 and 21.0 ammonium sulfate and I'll do the rest. I've gone down a rabbit hole watching the back catalog going back to October 2023. Enjoy every minute of these master classes better than an extension course. I, I put that in there because he said that better than an extension course. As you all might know, I used to be an extension professor at UF and I was an extension professor here, or no, I guess my technically my appointment here at UK was research, but I did extension here research at, at UK as well. And um, I, I prided myself on getting a good extension program going and, you know, having value and, you know, trying to get an impact. Um, and I think we did good. Well, I know we did really well in Florida. I think we did some good stuff here in Kentucky too. Um, but I'm pretty quickly becoming convinced that this, you know, venue or this channel of communication is probably more efficient than what I did in academia. So that's the reason I put that in there as a comment to mention. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Andrew Burr says this whole series on potassium has been eye opening and is counter to everything that you hear about potassium. I now have a bunch of potassium nitrate I don't want to apply. <laughs> Potnet is good stuff, though. I mean, you know, it's expensive. It's whatever it is, 1,400 a ton, 1,500 a ton. Now, I don't know what it is nowadays, but it's expensive for nitrogen. But if you need potassium, I mean, you know, it's okay. <laughs> Just if you don't need potassium, it's a very expensive way to put out nitrogen if you don't need the potassium. So I, I feel for you. I, mean, I empathize. Mr. Jackson, this is on the Lesco NOS marketing. It's worth watching. I put out a video called Lesco NOS marketing. Marketing is worth watching. It says they're just saying stuff. They have, I guess that's something I said as it in quotes. Can't help but chuckle every time. I very much appreciate your transparency with the science. <laughs> You're very welcome, Mr. Jackson. I appreciate you watching. This author was intentionally omitted because I didn't want to say anything that he didn't feel comfortable with. Um, will you be touching base on iron deposits forming under the PGA greens? That guess was fascinating. The drilling and mud logs recording is very interesting. This topic is honestly one of the most interesting green, um, interesting green industry deep dives I've seen in many years. Is there any way I could just pay directly for six months or a year instead of monthly? I'm old school and still try to operate in cash spectrum as much as I can. Plus you'd get 100% of the money and nobody stepping on your membership. Yeah, see, I tried, I mean, I looked into that and I can understand why YouTube wouldn't allow that because they want to get a cut of it. Um, but for the, to the best of my knowledge, I don't, I don't think there's a way to do that. I mean, so I even asked, can I just give someone a membership for free? Like if they want a contest and I just wanted to gift somebody a membership without me actually paying money, I just like check a box and say, hey, you're a member. And they said, that's not, a, that's not currently an option in YouTube. So I tried, but it does, I don't know of a way. I'm, I'm sure someone knows of a way to do that to where I can give someone a membership or somehow discount it. I don't know, but I'm not aware of how to do that. So if you are, if you are aware of how to do that and you want to help me out, drop me a line or shoot me an email and explain it to me and I'll see what I can do. Now, Richard Harwell. This was in response to a video I did called Soil Test Kits that to Avoid. I used one of these soil tests a while back and I was not impressed. It just looked like a fertilizer brochure when I got the results back. 
then I noticed the others influ the other influencers would have a soil test that they were promoting that was basically the same company and the recommendations would come back with their fertilizers. It seems like this is more of a marketing ploy than a soil test. Yeah, let me confirm that for you. Okay. <laughs> you are correct. Home soil tests, with the exception of one soil test um, that I know of, um, when I'm talking about home soil tests, I'm talking about the soil tests that use this little ion exchange beads. Those are that's just all smoke and mirrors. It's all hogwash. Okay. There is a home soil test. In fact, I wasn't going to go into this, but let me pull it up because I can't remember the name of it. Um, There, um, there is a home soil test called what's the name of it? Let's see if I can find it. It's something like it. It, it has both Auburn and the University of Florida, um, sort of giving the stamp of approval. And it's called like I don't know the name of it. Um, that ain't it. Let me see if I can find it real quick for you guys. If you're interested in getting like a home soil test kit that actually is useful. It is, um, yeah, maybe someone could put it in the chat. It's something like soilkit.com or soiltestkit.com or, or, uh, my, uh, I can't remember. I can't find it. I don't know. I can't ever find it. I even, I even knew about it early on. I still, I still can't come up with the name, so it's, they don't. I don't know. They need to work on the name because I can't even remember it. I'm in the. I'm in the that world. and I can't remember it. Um, but what it is is it's a it's a home kit that you send the soil in, and they do it goes into Waters Lab, and they do a normal Malik three extraction on it. But when the extraction is conducted, the interpretation is determined by the university's interpretation. Okay. Is it soil kit? Is it is it is it called soil? Let me hang on. Let me see if this is it. Oh, this might be it. Hang on, let me see if I can find it here. This might be it right here. So thank you guys in the chat. Um, this might be it. Yeah, this is it. Okay, so I'm going to put this in the chat. I'm going to put this in the in the chat if you really are interested in um, doing something at home and you want to know what is actually a valid soil test kit. That's I put it in the head. It's 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 soilkit.com. That's soil yeah, soilkit.com. Now, when you do that, I I've, I haven't ever actually done it, but I was sort of in communication with some people that were designing it and working on it. When you do that, the sample goes into um a kit just I mean just like a mail home thing just like you would normally get from some of the other um uh oops some of the other home lawn kits, okay, would, you're going to send it, you're going to put it in a little container, you're going to mail it in. Um, but it, it, it is, it, it, uh, a normal soil extraction is done on it. A normal soil test extraction is used on it, Malik 3. And like I said, because the, because I don't know what Auburn does exactly, but I know at University of Florida, they can, inter the soil kit company works with the University of Florida and they adjust the interpretations based upon the University of Florida's data with the faculty, not, not the big mama UF. Okay. It's the faculty, the turf faculty at UF. Okay. 
So whenever a, a correlation or a, a calibration is conducted at UF and they find more refined numbers, they adjust that through that through that program. The interpretation is adjusted rapidly, very quickly. You don't have to go through a bunch of other hoops and stuff. They can make that adjustment quickly. Okay. So if you want a home test kit, I mean, I don't sell them. I don't make any money on them or anything. But if you want a home test kit, that's what I would use. Um, rather than these other kit test kits that are, I'm, I'm sure soil kit probably has products that they also would like for you to buy. I'm not saying they don't, I'm, I don't know. Um, but the test itself is valid. At least that's valid. I don't mind someone trying to sell you something. I mean, if that's what capitalism is about, but do so in an honest upfront way. Don't do it with a soil kit test that is completely invalid or maybe not completely invalid, but is not supported by evidence. Okay. That's the issue with the, soil test um, resin bead that you'll often see and and but it permeates youtube okay so that's where i would go if you're interested in that okay back to the chat uh, the, the comments i'm going to move quickly it's, it's already 10 30 chill baka really cool name i've looked through the videos but maybe i missed it are there any good data on biochar humic acid products for warm season grass quality is there good evidence anywhere supporting use of sea kelp even big name brands now are advertising its benefits, but it's unclear to me. Yeah, it's pretty much unclear to everybody, okay? <laughs> so don't feel bad, Chilbaka, okay? It's not clear to many people at all. And there's a couple articles I'll end up going over, but don't feel bad. It ain't it ain't clear. There, if it's not clear to like the average homeowner, don't assume that it's, it's obviously clear to researchers because it's not always the case, okay? So I replied back to him. I'll go over these topics in the future. In the meantime, I would not spend money on any soil related product until water, light, temperature, and injury are accounted for. If those risk factors are accounted for and I got to soil products, I would not spend any money on any soil product until nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and potentially pH are at optimum levels. By that time, it is unlikely that other soil related products would be worth the money. Okay, so what I'm trying to go over there is this, this risk factor pyramid that I have a whole, art, whole episode based on this, this pyramid. And what I've told Chilbaka is that I wouldn't spend any money on soil products until I got all the way up to the top of this pyramid. I checked off the water box, the light box, the temperature box, and the injury box. Then even when I got to the fertile soil box on this pyramid, within that box, I wouldn't do anything until I checked off the nitrogen box, the phosphorus box, the potassium box, and the pH box. Okay. Once I checked off those three or four element boxes, and I still haven't solved the problem, then maybe I would consider something else. Okay. Some, one of these sea kelp products or humichar or whatever these products are. Okay. That's a, the, by the time you get to all those steps, and you got all the water optimized, the light optimized, temperature, and you've checked off all that stuff, there's no injury, you've checked off the nitrogen, the phosphorus, potassium, pH, the chances of you curing or solving the problem that you're seeing are pretty high. You're probably going to solve it by going up the pyramid in that fashion. But if you don't, by that point, then perhaps some of these other products might give you a little bit of a benefit. That would be my take on that for now. Oh, my wife's still in the chat. Yeah, the pyramid of turf evidence, <laughs> risk factors. Let's go to the next, go to the next uh, comment. Chuck Benzing says, thank you, Dr. Shaddix, for what you are revealing through published scientific literature on the topics you choose to discuss. I'm always looking forward to the next one, especially when you swerve into the claim-based analysis without making a personal reproach. You've made that clear, but I wanted to make sure it's acknowledged and well-received. Thank you, Chuck. I do, do, I do my best to separate the claim from the person. Um, I see no benefit in attacking people, although Thomas Jefferson would disagree with me. He, he seemed to think ridicule would be useful. Um, I, no, I, that's just not my style. I'd prefer not to do that. Uh, but I will assertively and without remorse attack claims. And I'll do that the best I can with scientific evidence. Kids Wrestling says on the soil test kits to avoid video, he says, but all farmers do it. Every season for crop enhancement, farmers do it. What I said was I would avoid these soil test kits. They're not useful. You know, I wouldn't, wouldn't use these. But all the farmers do it. Does anybody want to put in the chat what, what flaw that is? <laughs> but they did it. Farmers do it down the road. 
They do it for crop enhancement. That's a flaw. I put that in there. That's a fallacy. So it doesn't matter what farmers do. It doesn't matter what your neighbor does. It doesn't matter if 15 people down the street do it. It doesn't matter if we've been doing it for 15 years. All those are bad reasons. The reason they're bad reasons is because they're known flaws in logic. The flaw in this particular logic is called two quoquet. Well, you did it. The farmers do it. So, so there, I'm doing it too. <laughs> it's also a historical fallacy too. So I put that in there as just some fun for kids wrestling to, to get some ink. Yeah, lawns aren't ag either, Gray Fox. You're right. Turf grass is, well, I'm, obvious bi I'm obviously biased, okay? But find me another plant on earth that's, that's better at absorbing nutrients than turf grass. Good grief. I mean, you couldn't create, I mean, if it didn't exist, you couldn't create a plant more efficient at holding, holding the earth stable, absorbing nutrients, turning inorganic nutrients into organic nutrients, you know, absorbing contaminants. You could, you, you know, releasing carbon into the soil naturally through organic chelates and or, or, uh, root ex exudates into the soil, absorbing carbon dioxide, you know, creating a cooler environment. You couldn't create one better than turf grass. Come on. It's, it's, it's crazy. Back to the comments. Rob, thank you for your pro level membership. Thank you very much. Welcome. Gardener Earth Guy, minimum soil test levels will differ among soils. That was a video I did, a short little video. And he says, I've never trusted soil tests. Many years of hydroponic work brought me focus into the parts per million and pH of irrigation water and also miners in that well. Some miners can't really be removed even with reverse, reverse osmosis. Honestly, I think the irrigation water should have been tested in each of these papers we're going over. Very good question. Very good comment. I'm Gardner Earth Guy, and I can assure you whenever I've done studies, I test the irrigation water, the water that I use, and I apply the carrier water to the non-treated control plots, especially because I've done so much iron work and foliar work that if there's anything in that, uh, that carrier water that could alter the solubility or the uptake of the nutrients I'm applying to the turf grass, I need to account for that in the, in the non-treated product, in the non-treated turf grass. So I can't speak for every scientist, but I can speak for me is that I do want to know what's in that irrigation water for scientific purposes because I want to know if it's altering it. And even know whatever's in it, I still put out the carrier water at the same volume on the non-treated plots to account for that any variation that could occur as a result of that. So good comment. And I'll say for the most part, I think it's probably accounted for in the irrig the irrigation water contents are probably measured and accounted for, even if they're not published in the literature. Maybe they should be published in the literature. Maybe we should include that in the publications. But generally, well, always with me, but I would say in general, it's my uh, position that I think most researchers probably do that same thing. Could be wrong. Next, next comment. Mitch Bird, the savings is just one side of the information you are providing. As an industry, you are helping reduce consumption, waste, and lessening the environmental impact LCOs have on the environment. Yes, I hope so, Mitch Bird. Very little in the turf grass industry gives me, gives me more pleasure than knowing that my actions are having a beneficial impact on the industry. Very little. But oftentimes, I don't get that feedback. You're right. Well, on this channel, I do a lot. You guys are awesome. I mean, you guys give me feedback all the time. That's what I'm saying. I get more feedback and data from YouTube than I ever did as an, as an academician. So I, I, for some reason in May, actually, I'll go over some of the mental, uh, um, health stuff. And I'll just ask my wife to, you know, not say anything right now, but, um, I'll go over all that as to some sort of what drives me and motivates me. And it'll help probably make a little bit more sense in May when I go over that topic. Um, but for some reason that drives me M money is, you know, it, it's, it's, you gotta have it, but, um, what motivates me is knowing I'm having a positive impact. So thank you for saying that Mitch. Um, Valerio Maleri, and I think he, he just became a member tonight, if I'm not mistaken. At least like, I think he did at the very beginning of the show tonight. So Malaria is a, a member now. I saw a video by Bill Kreuzer of Nebraska talking about soil testing. I think he was saying that the minimum levels for an element in the soil, he was talking about phosphorus, can change based on the speed of the growth of the lawn. I imagine this comes from the soil not having enough time to release the non-exchangeable elements into the solution, or that the lawn not being as quick to mobilize the non-exchangeable elements. Could this be a correct hypothesis? First of all, I just want to say to Valerio, that is such a, a good 
paragraph? <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's just such a great question. The way he worded it, I saw so-and-so said this. I was thinking about this. Could this be a correct hypothesis? I mean, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great paragraph. Back to it. It says, I answer this question. I say, he says, is this the correct hypothesis? I say, in a sense, yes. There's a lot going on in the soil plant system. Let's consider the following. If we correlate something simple like nitrogen with turf grass quality over a year, would you expect to see the amount of nitrogen or the, would you expect the amount of nitrogen to be consistent or vary across seasons? If it varies across seasons, when do you think the greatest amount of nitrogen would be needed to maintain acceptable turf grass? Winter, spring, summer, or fall? You guys can put that in the chat if you guys are still paying attention here. When do you think the most, if you're going to correlate nitrogen to turf grass quality, in other words, I'm not correlate, calibrate. If you're going to calibrate, did I say correlate or calibrate? I said correlate, so it should be calibrate. If you're going to say, okay, how much nitrogen does the turf grass need to maintain acceptable turf grass, to maintain acceptable levels? And I'm going to measure that all season long. When do you think the most amount of nitrogen would be needed? In the winter, spring, summer, or fall? The re and I'll just, if you got, I got a 15 second delay, so I'll give it a second or two. But the reason I say that is because what Bill's saying here is that the minimum levels can change based upon the growth speed of the lawn and so forth. And I would just add on, and I agree, it will change based upon the growth of the grass. I'll add on to that is the turf grass is eventually going to hit a limit of growth that is, it's going to hit a, a point of growth that is limited by some factor other than nutrients, i.e. light or temperature or water. At some point during the season, especially if it's warm season grass, or even if it's cool season grass in the middle of August, you know, in, in Kentucky, or if it's warm season grass, say in Alabama, North Alabama, you're growing Bermuda grass, it's going to slow down in the winter. So as it begins to slow down in the winter, you can kind of gain a few weeks by making sure the nutrients are at optimum levels. But at some point, the quality is going to decline one way or the other. And if you do a calibration on that, you're going to keep pumping more and more nitrogen in the system to keep that quality up and up and up. When in, 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 you, you will do that. You will keep the quality up. Uh, pro, you will prolong the quality to some degree as, as it's beginning to decline in the, in the seasons. But it's declining as a result of some other limitation. And you can only hold it up so far and then it's going to collapse and go into, go into dormancy. So it is at, at the, in the winter or, it, or in warm season grasses or in the summer and cool season grasses, when the grass is not wanting to grow as a result of light temperature or water, when the most amount of nitrogen would be needed to maintain acceptable levels. The, the amount of N you need to maintain, for example, um, Bermuda grass growing in North Florida in December and January is extremely high compared to the amount of nitrogen you would need, say, in June or July. Because in June or July, it's growing naturally anyway. It's growing fine because the temperature and water and light's all fine. But in those winter, in the, in the bookend seasons of fall and spring, it's declining. It's limited by something else. Okay. So in his question with phosphorus, it's a long-winded way of saying the amount of phosphorus you need is going to change based upon the growth habit of the grass. And the, and the, when the grass is limited by light or water or something else, you might need to have more phosphorus to help it along a little bit further. But it's a losing cause. It's going to, because it's limited by something other than phosphorus, other than nitrogen, at something out of your control, like temperature or light. Okay. So keep that in mind is that and that's the reason I have water, light, and temperature as the major impacting factors. Because in, the, in where, let's pick Utah, and you're, and you're wanting the grass to grow well, wanting the grass to grow well, and it's looking well, looking well, and all of a sudden, before you know it, you got everything going, you got 400 lawns, everything's looking good, and you didn't realize it's July. And you're like, man, I'm getting phone calls all over creation because the, the, the Kentucky bluegrass is looking horrible. Well, it's not looking horrible because you're a program. It's looking horrible because it's going into heat dormancy. It's so hot. It's, it's, it's slowing down. And there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Okay. So keep that in mind. The phosphorus levels will change and the, the nitrogen requirements will change based upon the growth habit of the grass. But I don't really think there's, that's something that I would, I would, throw the kitchen sink at because it's out of your control anyway 
you might gain a little bit of extra color, a little bit extra quality here or there, but it's going to cost a tremendous amount of resources in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus and money to gain just a little bit in return because it's limited by some other factor out of your control. Next comment. Chris Young says, this comment isn't so much about this particular video, but the body of videos you're making. It is so refreshing to hear an expert, and I believe you are one. Well, thank you. Um, I, yeah, well, thank you. Shoot down the claims of all these YouTube creators that are selling jugs of black slime <laughs> and bags of magic dust, claiming that do this miraculous thing, which will transform my lawn into a golf course. I'm new to DIY lawn care, but even I could discern that these products and claims are ridiculous. I wish people in general were more skeptical about what they see, read, and hear, not just about lawn care, but everything. We are far too gullible as a society for our own good. Keep making these videos and shining light on the BS. Yeah, if you want to be uh, the comment section, write something that makes me laugh. <laughs> You're almost guaranteed. I'll copy and paste that into the word and I'll, have, I'll read it on air. Um, and his point is, is that we're, we're human. We're all biased. We're all gullible. And um, we get taken advantage of. And I feel the same way. I get taken advantage of too. But I try to limit that as best I can using critical thinking. And the, 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 yes, this channel is about turf grass. Yes, mainly about nutrients and so forth in the last several months. But really, the the read between the lines here is that the uh, what I'm trying to do is to to either develop or continue to develop if you already have them critical thinking skills so that you know your behavior and your actions not um, that are are evidence based not just in turf grass but just in life in general so that you you're you're protected more protected at least from being taken advantage of by those less than honorable men and women who we. Will remain nameless. Chuck Benzing says, "No, n equals up, p equals down, k equals all around." It was late last year when perhaps you or another person discussed a conversation face to face with someone looking to sell late season fertilizers. That's when the whole idea of k came up and became fashionable. Yeah, I've, I told that story before, where I have a good friend who was in a, or actually his friend, I think it was, was in a meeting um, years ago in the 1980s with a major lawn care company. And they were just trying to come up with another way to sell around, sell around or whatever. So it was October, November. They knew they couldn't go out and start pounding it with nitrogen anymore. So like, what can we do? What can we sell somebody on? And how can we spin it such that it would be beneficial to them? And it's my understanding that's how these winterizer fertilizers came around. That's how these late season potassium applications came around. And um, it's mostly hogwash. I mean, if your potassium is high enough, you're not going to see much benefit from that. But as the paper we showed today indicated, if your potassium is low enough and the conditions are ripe for a winter kill, then there may be a benefit for those late season applications of potassium. Kind of just uh, depends on the situation. I would say that, like I said, even the author said, it's rare. It, nothing ever happened for five years. Nothing happened. And in this one year, all the stars aligned just right. And the turf, the POA in that case, got dinged with some winter kill. And uh, the potassium reduced that risk. So... I'm not saying there's no benefit, but in general, the the benefits are quite low. Back to the comments. Esteban Campos says, price, that's what made me look into different options for lawn care. That's, last year was my first year with the lawn, and at the end of the year, I checked the amount of money I spent on this, and it was a disaster. I followed the program of a company that I was that I thought was funded by Sons. I follow, I follow the program of a company that I think was funded by the Sons of a guy named and or something and i put myself to work to not make that same mistake again that's how i found your channel and it has been amazing for me and it's, let's not mention the amount of money that will save me this year yeah well that's the goal the goal is to have fun i mean i'm only on this planet for if i'm lucky 90 years okay <laughs> that's it and there's no second act okay so then the point is to enjoy our time here and enjoy our time on the lawn and, and enjoy, you know, the, the landscapes and the horticulture and have fun with it. It shouldn't be a chore. It shouldn't be difficult. And, and generally it's not. So I'm, I'm glad you're finding some value in it and hopefully it's making it more easy for you and save some of your money. So glad to hear that. Last Cast Production says, new, new subscriber now for a few months. Just want to say you're doing great work, Doc. As a Canadian, having 99% of, of lawn stuff illegal in our province us Canadians used to used to be envious of the plethora of inputs the U.S. has. Now, just in a few months, I've realized, and hopefully more Canadians do too, we have been doing it right the whole time. YouTube has definitely influenced many of us up here to do more 
And now that I think it has most of the old folks that I know that it has fantastic lawns, don't even watch YouTube. A bag of Scott's 2600 and chelated iron for weeds and they're smoking it. Again, great work, Dr. Shaddix. I need to get back to the old ways of lawn care and enjoy the mow like it used to be. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to just, you know, beat down any new technologies or new products or new ways of doing things. I don't, I don't necessarily, I hope I don't come across that way. I'm, I'm open to new ideas, but to convince me it takes evidence, right? It doesn't take some marketing sheet. So for example, um, well, <clears throat> let's take, for example, um, I'll just use polymer coated ureas. Although and you all know, I, I don't, I don't really value, uh, I don't want to include slow release materials unless I have a good reason. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of good reasons for it. But slowly, but polymer coated ureas came around in the early '90s, and they changed a lot of the industry. And and you could argue for the better or for the worse, but there's value in those. Reduces the risk of burn for sure. So there's value in some of those products like that. So I don't want to poo-poo everything that comes out that's new, but <clears throat> but what I do want to critique and hope everybody critiques is one doing things for no good reason. That's that's silly. But two, um, being directed in the, uh, away from the problem and towards solutions to the problem by less than honorable men and women in, in marketing and sales and whoever else it is. They, they, they're trying to get your money. And oftentimes it's worth spending the money with them. I mean, that, that's no doubt. I mean, there's, you know, pre-emergent herbicides that are extremely valuable to our industry that you might not have in Canada. And in the United States, it's, it's generally accepted that those are, those are good and safe products. But, um, so, so they're useful. Um, but a lot of the stuff that they want to sell is just the newest thing since sliced bread. And I'm not buying it until I see some evidence. I'm not buying it literally and metaphorically. Show me some evidence. I don't care what Joe Bob down the street's doing. I don't care what you say he saw. Okay. Show me some evidence from a non-biased source or the best we can from a non-biased source. And then I'll start talking about it. And then I'll start believing it. You know, I'll start considering it. Okay. But to me, evidence starts in the, in the literature, not on some marketing sheet. Thank you. Last cast of production. I appreciate that comment. Oh, that's it. The last one. So that's it for the, the comments. I wrapped it up. So that was a little bit of a long episode, but I'm going to be gone for two weeks. So I'll be back. Um, it's two weeks from the night. I'll be back two weeks from the night. I'm going to go down with my wifey who's already in Florida. And I'm going to go down with my kids tomorrow. And we're going to have some fun on some spring break down there and get on a boat and do some fun stuff. Appreciate everybody showing up tonight. Um, let me look at the chat, see if there's any questions I missed. Uh, Juan Ro Roca Gonzalez says, hello, Dr. Shaddix, will the use of organic compost as top dressing provide any benefits to the soil? Well, sure. I mean, probably, I don't know your soil, but if you have a very inert soil or not a very productive soil, adding organic compost is very likely going to be beneficial to you. Okay. Um, if you have a soil like I have in Kentucky where nutrients are, you know, sky high, the chances are very low that adding organic compost is, would be beneficial to the same degree, at least. So it kind of depends on the soil. But, you know, I, I'm not anti-organic, um, but I'm, an, I'm anti-organic fertilizer that contains phosphorus that is applied at the rate of nitrogen. That doesn't make sense, and the, the science is there to support that. Don't, don't do that. That's, that's a big no-no. Um, any other questions? What are the... Zoop, zoopy? Zoop E891, I guess that's the name. It says, what's your thoughts on the growing popularity of the use of... Oh, yeah, I've got this question. So let me read this. What's, the, what's, the th what's your thoughts on the growing popularity of using DEF, which is diesel exhaust fluid, as liquid urea to spray on your lawn? And actually, I thought I had that in one of the comments. I guess I omitted it as a comment because I was... I had, at one point, I had it in the comments because I was going to... Um, I was going to answer that question. Um, so I'm going to take this off because I don't think anybody's going to call. Uh, 
I looked into it briefly, and from it's my understanding, so correct me where I'm wrong in the chat, that this DEF product is essentially urea in a very clean water. Like, I don't know if it's deionized water or RO water, or I don't know what kind of water it is. But from the little bit that I could gleam off the internet, it's essentially urea in DI water. <laughs> so if that's the case, and I'm not saying it is, because I don't know, but if that's the case, then what I would do is I would figure out what the cost is per thousand square feet or per acre or whatever you want to, whatever area, to put out a pound of in or a quarter pound of in or whatever, you know, whatever rate you want to put out. I'd figure out what that costs using that product and then just compare that to spray grade urea, urea or, you know, some other liquid nitrogen source that you could buy in the fertilizer industry. I, I don't know why there would, I don't know if there would be any concern at all if all that's in there is DI water and urea. It would be, as far as I can tell, fine. I, I don't even know why that would even be sold. I don't, I don't. I don't know what it does for diesel exhaust fluid. I don't know why urea is even needed for that. But, um, but if all it is is urea in water, then it's fine. But I'm not saying that's all it is. I don't know. But there's a little bit that I learned about it. It seems like that's what it is. Rob, hello to you. Thank you for saying hello in the chat. Thank you, Andrew Burst. Yeah, uh, my little girl. She's you know. She's always had some problems respiratory wise. I'll tell you about some stories about her when she was a baby that actually the story about Lisa and Lou, I don't know if my wife's still in the chat. My daughter is an alar is largely responsible for us leaving Florida and coming to Kentucky. There was a very scary instance that we, incident that we had with my daughter when I was in Fort Lauderdale and my wife and I just said, we're done. We're out. <laughs> we're leaving. And, um, so She's why we're here, and a large, large reason why we're here in Kentucky instead of Florida. Harper Explorers. Are there any reliable studies that show efficacy in wetting agents? So like the length of time that a turf grass would respond to a wetting agent? I'm assuming that's what you mean by efficacy. I'll go into wetting agents. I'll say specific to efficacy, I can't think of a study, I'm sure that probably exists, I can't think of a study off the top of my head like this specifically is going to result in greater efficacy um, or this product at this rate is going to result in greater efficacy. It, it probably exists, um, but I'm more familiar with the, the wetting agent literature as it, is in, as it is related to ball roll or uniformity, distribution of water uniformly across the surface or turf response to wetting agents, not specifically about the wet efficacy per se, but I'll go into wetting agents. Well, I'll say this, wetting agents are very valuable um, in locations that may be prone to um, dry soils or localized dry spots or having the soil dry out non-uniformly across the lawn or across the football field or across the fairway. It's not, they're not necessarily going to result in deeper penetration of water or greater retention of water at the surface like they're marketed. That's all complete nonsense. Um, but when it comes to the uniform distribution of water, um, there's a great deal of evidence to indicate that they are valuable for that. So if you happen to have a lawn that happens to be drier at the top of the hill and wetter at the bottom of the hill, or for some reason, this part of your putting green is always a little drier than the other, or this fairway or this, you know, those sorts of hot spots that kind of come up and there's, there's non-uniformity in the distribution of moisture across the uh, laterally across the surface of the turf, then these wetting agents, many different types of wetting agents, um, well, I would argue that they're pretty much going to result in all the same response for the most part. Um, but they can be very valuable in those cases, yes. Oh, and Andrew Burr says it's cheaper to melt down 4600. So if that's the case between that and the DEF product, and I'm not saying it is, um, if, if Andrew Burr is saying that it is less expensive to use uh, spray grade um, 4600, then you use that. I mean, think about it like this, guys. Manufacturing wise, and I'm taking anhydrous ammonia out of it for a second, but manufacturing wise, the first step in pretty much all nitrogen sources nowadays is urea, 4600. So in manufacturing, once it's prilled, anything you do to it is going to add cost because a human being is going to interact with it and you have to pay that human being. So if you're going to take that urea and you're going to put it in water, someone has to do that. Someone has to package it. Someone has to, you know, 
So it's going to cost more money. So there's, it's very difficult to get less expensive than granular urea, whether you're spreading it out or whether you're melting it down. It's, it's very difficult to get less expensive than that. You can, gain, you can have an ROI. You can have a return on that investment by spending money, more money on other things um, in the sense that if you're not clear on how these nutrients blend well in a jar or blend well in a t- container, if you don't know how to do that, then it may be worth, and you're going to say put out N and P and K and iron and all this stuff all in one liquid. It may be in your best interest to go ahead and pay because the chemists and those companies have already done that for you and you don't have to worry about gumming up your screens or screwing something up. But if you're going to talk about straight nitrogen, it's very difficult to get less expensive than straight urea. Just by sheer math, you, I mean, once it's made, you can't get less expensive than that you, because you're always going to be doing something to it that costs money. Um, Chuck Benzing says, I'm curious about the effect of potassium on this paper tonight. Where none was applied, the recovery was minimal. Do you suspect seed heads were removed when mowing? Oh, I, I don't, I don't know, Chuck. We'd have to ask the authors about that. Yeah. The recovery, I think what they were talking about was recovery from the plant that was already there, not recovery from seed, you know, being, you know, planted or seed coming down and then germinating and then recovering that. I think they were talking about recovery straight from the plant. Okay. A couple more questions. I'm going to have to go guys. Reed Grevin says, would you would love your channel to have a one to two minute intro promo video, introducing yourself credentials and goal of the channel. Maybe some highlights of answering questions, easy to link to Facebook forums. Reed, that's a really good comment. I mean, I've been asked that before and YouTube keeps, keeps, uh, reminding me to do that. Um, I'm just going to plead ignorance. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've seen other channels that have like a real brief video when people come on and say, Hey, this is so-and-so and welcome to the channel. Da, da, da. I'll get to it. Uh, so thank you for the comment. Uh, it reminds me, I got to do that. So. Oh, and so, and so my wife says, yeah, my, my daughter was a big part of us coming to Kentucky. Family is everything. Yep. And Ignacio Pace says, opinion on PGR's claim to improve plant health, such as improve drought tolerance, reduce water use, and more extensive root system water season. So Ignacio, PGR's were um, included as a, co- as a topic for um, the members. I'm, I'm giving my members the opportunity to give me their feedback. And that I'm not saying I will do it, but I'm going to, probably direct my content more towards what the members are interested in seeing when they vote. So right now they want to see humic acids and then followed by looks like soil testing after that. And so I'll probably end up going that direction, but a PGRs is on my list. Okay. I'm not a PGR expert, but I know a PGR expert and he will come on here. I'm sure and give us whatever we want to know. And I'll go over the literature on that. But it's my understanding that there are there is pretty good evidence in the literature that the use of PGRs can, with some consistency, result in greater turf grass quality and increased plant health, if you want to call it plant health. Um, but I'm not an expert in that area, so be, be gentle with any criticism of my comment on that, because I'm I'm, that's a little bit outside of my specialty. But it is on my list, Ignacio, and I will go over it. Um, but I can't just rattle off stuff on PGRs like I can on soils and nutrients because I, I, I know that literature very well, but I don't know PGR literature well enough to really feel confident, confident commenting on that just off the top of my head. And last comment, Transition Zone Guy says, believe I found the potassium deficiency Twitter profile pic. Can't attach it. Oh, please do. Well, email it to me right now. I, I'll, I'll hang on for another three or four minutes if you got it. If you email it to me, I'll put it up on the channel before I hang up because <laughs> I'm not going to go over potassium again for a while. That would be great transition zone guy. I mean, if you found it, send it to me. I'll check my email because um, I don't know what I did with that dang photo, but I can't find the thing. I'll hold off for about another minute or two. If you can email it to me, I'll, it'll, it'll pop up on my phone and I'll read those. I'll read one more from Wilson Miranda. I was told urea drops pH in the long term in soil more than ammonium sulfate, which is acidic. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. Wilson, um, urea will not drop pH to that degree. It will drop pH as a result of nitrification in the long run, very little. 
Um, but it will, you know, just like any nitrogen source that can be nitrified, there will be a, a little bit of a, um, acidification over time from the application of that type of nitrogen source, but not like ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate, you're adding eight protons for every ammonium sulfate molecule that goes directly into the system. So you're injecting literally eight hydrogen protons or ions directly into the turf grass system by the application of ammonium sulfate. So ammonium sulfate is exceedingly acidif acidifying and it can be used to your advantage or disadvantage depending on what type of system you have. Okay. So, but urea is not near as acidifying as ammonium sulfate, not even close. Uh, okay. Well, tell you what, transitioning zone guys, send that to me. Maybe I'll make it a point of showing that, that clip or that little photograph on the next, um, on the next show briefly, but I do appreciate that greatly. If you can send that to me, cause I can't find that dang thing. Okay, guys, guys and gals, I'll be back in two weeks. It'll, next show will be on a Thursday night at the same time, 9 p.m. in two weeks. Until then, I really appreciate everybody showing up and be kind. And I will leave you with a little bit of music and I will call my wife, who's probably still in the chat. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. See you in two weeks.